We're looking today at the transmission of the scriptures by John H. Skilton. So let's pray as we get started. We thank you, Father, for your word and thank you for this privilege that we've had to study the scriptures and to understand your work of inspiration and the infallible nature of your word. We pray that as we now consider the transmission of that word to us today, that your spirit would bless us, comfort our hearts, assure us of the integrity of your word for us today. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be uh, forthright and bold as we proclaim the message of the scriptures to our generation. Thank you for your love and care for us. We pray that you would bless our time together. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay, now, as you're aware, this is a symposium by the uh, faculty of Westminster Seminary. We're considering John Skilton. He was not one of the original members of the faculty, at least I don't believe so. Um, he came on a few years afterwards. Uh, he was a student at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, graduated and received a call to a church in uh, Maine, state of Maine. Let me see if I can get my information correct here. Um, so he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1928. He enrolled at Westminster and was ordained in 1933. And uh, he served as pastor of Second Parish Presbyterian Church in Portland, Maine. Maine. Um, that was a church within the PCUSA um, at that time. And uh, so he led that church out of the mainline Presbyterian Church into the OPC in 1936. <clears throat> so he's ordained in 33, serves at Second Parish Church in Maine, and moves them to the OPC in 36. And then in 1939, he joins the faculty at Westminster Seminary and taught as a professor of the New Testament. Um, it, it turns out that he is the longest serving faculty member on Westminster's uh, seminary uh, list of faculty um, from 1936, excuse me, 39 is it? Where did I see that? 39, he joined Westminster and he, he taught there until 1973. So uh, he also continued teaching in his retirement uh, up until he was like 91 years of age. Um, so he obviously retained his intellectual faculties and good health for an extended period of time. Um, he died at the age of 93 um, in 1998, July 22nd, 1998. I'm sorry, he was born in 1906, so 1906 to 1998 was uh, his years. Um, he uh, has written a number of books, uh, Scripture and Confessions is one of them. He edited uh, Machen's book um, on the book of Galatians. Let me see if I can pull that out quickly. Probably not. Here it is. So, uh, Machen's notes on, uh, let me get the screen out in front of me here, his notes on uh, Galatians, and you'll see down here uh, Skelton's name on it. So he pulled all these notes together and published them. Um, I think it's only the first three chapters or so of the book of Galatians. I so, um, didn't get the whole book itself, but... Uh, Skilton was involved in that. He was an editor of the Westminster Theological Journal for a number of years, uh, which is a highly academic uh, journal um, meant for other professors and other seminaries to interact with, that sort of thing, and, and students, pastors as well. Um, but highly uh, technical journal for theology, and he was an editor for that. Um, so I had him uh, as a professor back in 1979, probably the fall of 79 or the spring of 1980, somewhere around there. Um, I would have had a course on the introduction to the New Testament, and John Skilton taught that. Um, 
I remember we met in uh, Van Til Hall, the big uh, auditorium there at Westminster. Maybe some of you have been there. Um, and uh, he would be up behind the podium there and lecture away. And I would be uh, in one of the seats uh, towards the back, <laughs> uh, scribbling away with my notes. I tried to find my notes. I wondered if I still had a copy of them, and I, I didn't find them. So in the course of time, I guess they got misplaced or displaced. <laughs> This or this, but um, I I remember him as, as a, um, a very sound academic, um, very careful in his exposition of the text of Scripture and his development of the Old Test or excuse me of the New Testament, uh, and um, beyond that, you you appreciated his personality. He was a very gentle man, uh, very kind, uh, considerate of others. Uh, he was a bachelor throughout his life. Uh, he lived in the home that his parents had and he dedicated that home to uh, be a point of uh, missions for evangelism and uh, diaconal ministry within the, within the city of Philadelphia. So that, Skilton House. Right, the Skilton House Ministries is what he I uh, did there, and he was the minister in residence, I think, or something, you know, a title of that nature. Um, and so he did that for much of his uh, retirement years in particular, um, distributing food and uh, clothing to refugees from, I think it was Vietnam, uh, and others in, in the city. Uh, there's a, an article by one of the ruling elders in the OPC, um, what's his name? He taught at Philmont Christian Academy. He was a ruling elder at Trinity Church uh, and now serves as an elder at Cornerstone Church. Tom, oh, Tom. Tom, Tom Sorkness. Sorkness, yeah. Sorry. Sorry for forgetting that. Um, Tom wrote an interesting article, a, a memory of Skilton, whom he studied under and worked with in the Skilton House ministry and he was deeply affected by Skilton's life and uh, one of the things that uh, Tom Sorkness would do is go into Machen Hall at Westminster Seminary and, and look for John Skilton's portrait and if you go into Machen Hall you've got portraits of Van Til and Machen and you have a large picture of the original faculty and stuff and so a lot of these, uh, John Murray with his glass eye and <laughs> all the rest of it. And uh, the glass eye was the one that was smiling. <laughs> so um, uh, Sorkness would go in there and ask, well, where, where's uh, John Skilton's picture? And somebody there would look around and, I don't know, it's not here. And, and, and he was trying to make the point there was no picture of John Skilton there in, in Machen Hall. And he felt that was sad in that he, he had he was the longest serving faculty member of the seminary. He, he was near the start of the seminary. He started there in 39. So, uh, and, and he served with Van Til and Mary and uh, Machen, I guess, for a, not for very long, I'm sure, but he probably knew of Machen, of course. And um, so uh, he had an extensive uh, ministry to the school, taught effectively in the New Testament. Um, he got his doctoral degree at about the age 51 or so from the University of Pennsylvania, and his doctoral thesis was on the transmission of the New Testament. So we're right in his ballywick here as we look into that topic. Um, but uh, Sorkness said that he was renowned for his ability to memorize things and it's said that he had the whole Greek New Testament memorized. Uh, what is more, um, he uh, was on a, a train to uh, the University of Pennsylvania and he lost his, I think it was the doctoral thesis, and he had to rewrite the whole doctoral thesis from memory and he did that. He just had a remarkable memory um, so, um, yeah, th these are the, the special kinds of people that the Lord Jesus and His glory sends to the church to uh, 
equip his saints. And uh, we should really appreciate men like Skilton, Murray, Van Til, Machen. I mean, they don't come around every day. And um, so we're blessed to be able to learn from them still years later and hopefully grow in our faith. Um, so I personally didn't have much contact with Skilton. Uh, I was aware of his ministry in the Skilton House ministry and uh, our paths would cross on occasion, probably at the presbytery meetings, though I'm not sure about that. Um, I wasn't at the Philadelphia Presbytery for too long. Um, one of the New Testament professors at Westminster Seminary, a fellow by the name of Moises Silva, wrote uh, in appreciation, uh, quote, few and far between are those who combine as he has an unshakable and fearless commitment to Orthodox Christianity in its reformed expression alongside a most gentle and patient spirit. Um, so he, he passed away just short of his 92nd birthday and I have a picture of him for you here which I'll see if I can put in front of you. Um, it's a picture of him as a young man probably in his office at Westminster Seminary. Um, kind of a nice picture of him. Uh, there are some older pictures of him when he was uh, more of a retirement age. But uh, this is a nice picture of him. So that's John Skilton. Um, and he'll be introducing the New Testament to us here uh, in a unique way, focusing on the transmission of the scriptures. So, with that in mind, uh, Skilton begins his chapter with a quotation from the Westminster Confession of Faith. Just as a reminder, that is the statement of beliefs and doctrines held by uh, historic Presbyterians. Um, even the mainline Presbyterian Church still includes that as its, uh, 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 what do they call it, it's the symbols of faith that they receive uh, and learn from. Uh, not necessarily believe <laughs> anymore, but... Um, they, they still recognize that as part of their history, of course. Um, but uh, the Westminster Standards are the standard of doctrine for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church as well as the Presbyterian Church of America, in America. So, um, the uh, Confession begins with a statement on the Scriptures. Uh, the nature of the scriptures as inspired inerrant word of God, the, the canon of scripture, the list of books of the Old and New Testaments that we regard as scripture. And then it has this statement from the eighth section of that chapter, which is uh, a very important uh, comment. Again, it's not the kind of thing perhaps that you'll come across very often in a sermon. Um, but it's uh, foundational to our understanding of where we're at in history and time in terms of being believers in the Lord Jesus who study the Word of God. And so the Confession states, quote, The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of the writing of it was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages are therefore authentical. So as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal unto them. So the confession notes the, the work of inspiration with regard to the original documents of the Old and New Testaments as they were given to us in the original Hebrew and actually could also included uh, Aramaic as Daniel was written in Aramaic and was Esther written in Aramaic? I, I don't recall right now but I think there's one other, at least one other Old Testament book written in Aramaic. Esther and maybe Ezra. Ezra possibly as well. Or Nehemiah or something like that. Not the whole books but portions. Portions of it, okay. Um, but generally speaking, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, 
and then uh, the New Testament in Greek. And uh, so those original documents were written in these two languages. And so the question becomes, what happened to the original documents? Were they preserved? Do we still have them? Can we look at them today? Well, no. They were written on vellum, parchment, or what have you, and uh, they would wear out and decompose, and they're gone. But uh, those documents were copied and transmitted from generation to generation to the people of God, so that the Word of God, originally written, is passed on to us in its copies through Greek New Testament texts, through Hebrew uh, texts as well, even uh, by translation through the Greek Septuagint, which takes the Old Testament and translates it from the Hebrew into the Greek language. And we know that in the New Testament, Jesus and Paul would quote from the Greek uh, Old Testament, the Septuagint, from time to time to make their points. So. Um, the the message of, of the text was uh, transmitted through time in various copies. But the message retained its integrity uh, not because the copyists were inspired, uh, but because the copyists were preserved. They were uh, preserved by the Spirit of God working in history and time such that they uh, maintain a faithful record of the original documents. Uh, and so what has been transferred to us even today, uh, millennia later in terms of the Old Testament and Old and New Testament, uh, what comes to us today retains what uh, we will call and, and Skilton calls the, the essential purity of the original Old and New Testament texts. So the, the message of the gospel and all of its essentials comes through to us, and we'll see that as we go along here and we develop our understanding. But that's generally uh, the overview of what the confession is noting here. It's not saying that every copyist was inspired and wrote an infallible copy of the text before him. Um, that's not the case. I mean, historically, you look at these documents and you'll see that there are mistakes. Wh whatever line of documentary history you pursue, you'll find that there are variant readings all throughout the text. And so, um, if you're going to claim that the copyists were inspired when they copied the text such that their text was an infallible copy of the original infallible text, then you can't have mistakes. You can't have variant readings from one copyist to the next. They have to be identical from one to the next. And that's kind of one of the things that kind of sprained my brain, to use an old phrase from one of my former teachers. Um, one of the things that sprained my brain about the King James Only movement was their sense that the copyists were inspired and uh, the uh, translation of these things, or the, the transmission of these things were infallible, and the inspired translation into the King's English was inspired and, and infallible as well. And yet the actual history, which you can look at, shows that there are variant readings. Not that these readings affect any major doctrine or uh, requirement for Christian living, it's just minor things that are in most cases, don't change the meaning significantly one way or the other, uh, but there are variant readings there, and uh, you cannot have that if you're going to have an infallible copyist. Same with the translator. Um, so, you know, the King James Version has gone through uh, several editions as well, uh, from the original 1611 edition to those that came after it, and if the original was inspired and inerrant, are we back into the situation where the copyists who take that translation or uh, update the language somewhat or make some minor changes, um, are, are they also inspired and inerrant? If there is a, a, a difference from the 1611 translation up until some of the other translations later on, 
Well, um, what does that say for infallibility? Well, okay. Uh, let's get to uh, Skilton here, and he begins by quoting a fellow by the name of Dr. C. A. Briggs. Um, now, Briggs was somebody that if memory serves me correctly, he was brought up on charges in the Presbyterian Church in the late 19th century. And uh, I forget the disposition of those charges. Uh, I think he was found guilty uh, of them, probably of denying the deity of Christ or something to that effect. But um, uh, Skilton begins by quoting him from an article titled Critical Theories of the Sacred Scriptures in Relation to Their Inspiration. It's an article that was published in the Presbyterian Review. This is during the mainline Presbyterian Church before the OPC was formed, well before it, actually back in 1881. Um, so he writes, We will never be able to attain the sacred writings as they gladdened the eyes of those who first saw them and rejoiced the hearts of those who first heard them. If the external words of the original were inspired, it does not profit us. We are cut off from them forever. Interposed between us and them is the tradition of centuries and even millenniums." End quote. And Skilton says, These strange words are taken from a remarkably confused passage in an article written many years ago by Dr. C. A. Briggs. So Briggs here was saying that obviously we don't have the original manuscripts, they're lost to history, and we are separated from them by a great gulf of time, and so therefore um, you know, we've really lost inspired inerrant scripture. We don't have that, and uh, that was uh, something which then motivated him and others to think that there are errors in the text of such a nature that um, the infallibility and inspiration of the scriptures could be in doubt or in question. Or at least that the message that we receive today is uh, infallible, inerrant word of God. Dr. Briggs further asserts in the same passage, quote, doubtless by God's singular care and providence, they, that is the scriptures, have been kept pure in all ages and are therefore authentical. And Briggs is quoting from the Westminster Confession. Doubtless throughout the whole work of the authors, the Holy Spirit was present, causing his energies to flow into the spontaneous exercises of the writer's faculties, elevating and directing where need be, and everywhere securing the errorless expression in language of the thought designed by God. Uh, same article. But we, uh, this is Skilton here, I think, but we cannot in the symbolical or historical use of the term, I'm sorry, this is Briggs, uh, we cannot call this providential care of his word or superintendence over its external production inspiration. So Briggs notes that we don't have an inspired copy of the scriptures and with this uh, Skilton is going to agree on, on that particular point that the original text was inspired in errant word of God and we don't have inspired copies following after that. And so uh, now we get into Skilton himself. Conservative scholars, whatever their disagreements with Dr. Briggs may be, will readily grant that we cannot, in the technical sense of the term, call God's providential care of his word inspiration. Their viewpoint in this matter is that, is that which is, correct, is reflected in the Westminster Confession of Faith. According to the Confession, the canonical books were given by inspiration of God. Uh, chapter 1, Section 2. The Old Testament in the Hebrew and the New Testament in the Greek, the scriptures and the languages in which they were written or given, were immediately inspired by God. Chapter 1, section 8. 
Quite distinct from the inspiration of the original manuscripts has been the care and providence whereby the scriptures have been kept pure. It is by virtue of these two separate considerations, the immediate inspiration of the sacred writings in their original form, and the singular divine care and providence that the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek are to be regarded as authentical. Again, chapter 1, section 8 of the Confession. Indeed, far from confusing these two matters, conservative scholars would insist on making a very sharp distinction between them. So here, the liberal Briggs, at least on a, a superficial verbal form, uh, agrees with conservative scholars, or scholars agree with him on this particular point, that the original writings were inspired, but the copies of those original writings were not inspired. Uh, they're passed on to us through time in God's singular care and providence. And so that singular care and providence ensured that these writings were not lost to history, uh, and that key ideas or concepts were not lost to history. Uh, they're retained through the copies that we have with us today. Okay. If then we do not call God's care and providence by the name of inspiration, must we, must we grant that the centuries have cut us off forever from the words of the original, and that there is now no profit for us if those words were inspired? We can grant no such things. It almost sounds like the Apostle Paul. May it never be. <laughs> he uh, uh, strongly rejects that line of thinking, that because the original inspired copies are lost to us, and we therefore do not have access to the message of the inspired and errant Word of God. Um, so we'll see how he develops that. We will grant that God's care and providence, singular though they have been, have not preserved for us any of the original manuscripts, either of the Old Testament or of the New Testament. We will further grant that God did not keep from error those who copied the scriptures during the long period in which the sacred text was transmitted in copies written by hand. Okay, they didn't have Xerox machines to run them off. They didn't have computers to just kind of print up multiple copies. It was one uh, copyist sitting down at a desk with the original manuscript and the copy, and he's writing, you know, going back and forth, just writing back and forth what the copy is that he has. And you can imagine how errors could arise in that process where you know he, he skips a line in his eyes and doesn't realize it and he's just blanking out for a moment and then starts writing. So he might skip a whole line or he gets words mixed up or he misspells something. And you know we have spell check and sometimes it, it, it lets a word pass which is proper spelling but it's not the right word in terms of the sentence that we're writing. And you know, the copies might do the same thing, just uh, just reverse a couple letters. It, it, it's another word, but it's not the original word, and so you got, you got a problem with that. Um, but anyway, um, these copies were written by hand. And Skilton says, But we must maintain that the God who gave the Scriptures, who works all things after the counsel of His will, has exercised a remarkable care over his word, has preserved it in all ages in a state of essential purity. And you might underline that phrase there, essential purity. Um, it's an interpretation of what the Confession is saying when it says that the, um, the documents were, quote, kept pure in all ages and are therefore authentical. And when the confession originally says, kept pure in all ages, does that imply that they, the copies were inspired and inerrant and therefore absolutely free from any error whatsoever? And the history of interpretation of that phrase is, no, that's not what they're saying. They're saying that there's essential purity. In other words, the uh, message of the gospel and and the Christian life uh, included in that 
has come to us in its purity to, down through the ages. Now there might be little variations here and there on different things, uh, spelling, uh, name locations, numbers uh, of armies or what have you. There might be variations in that sort of thing, but that doesn't in any way affect uh, that our salvation is uh, the work of God by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and through Him alone, and that we are saved through His cross and resurrection and these kinds of things. That comes to us through the Scriptures loud and clear, and that, that is where the purity arises. The, the message of the Gospel, the message of uh, the law and the way that God wants us to live and the exposition of our sin and our need for the Savior, all that comes to us in essential purity. Um, and so we, we can rely on that and live our lives based on it. But marginal things, uh, yeah, th th there were uh, variant readings, as uh, I'll demonstrate in a little bit here. But they don't affect, really, the meaning of the text. Uh, and in fact, as I assume we'll get into as we go along here, um, there are critical tools uh, that we use to evaluate texts, variant readings, and determine uh, which are the more likely, more probable original reading so that we get an even more exact uh, understanding of what was in the original text. We got, say we have five different texts and each of them have a different reading or two have one reading and three have a different reading on one particular verse. Well, we can compare and contrast these texts and evaluate them uh, in terms of their integrity as a whole and in this particular situation and there are various rules that we use to interpret these things so that we can determine with some degree of confidence what the original text was and um, so uh, introduced this a little bit earlier but um, this is called a bring that up here a textual commentary of the Greek New Testament Okay, um, this explains for us, uh, it takes uh, variant readings in a particular text and it will explain why it is they believe that one variant reading is more likely original than the next. And they might grade their confidence in that A, B, C, D, or E, F, G, or whatever. <laughs> um, but they, they indicate we have strong confidence in this, we're, we're as certain as can be, or we're not quite sure, it could be one or the other, we think it's probably this one. Um, so um, there are textual critics who will evaluate the different um, possible readings, and here is, this is the, a copy of the Greek New Testament. This is a recent edition of it, and when you open it up, let me find, here's a good enough page, you see up above here, this is the Greek New Testament here. But down below, there's something that we call an apparatus. Uh, it's the variant readings of these particular verses. So you read along here, you might see a little letter A or a letter C or something, and that refers you down here to where there's going to be, let me just bring it up close so perhaps you can see it. Down below, there'll be a list of the different Greek manuscripts that support any particular reading. So you might have one reading that says, uh, God so loved the world, and you've got uh, 30 major script manuscripts that follow that. And then you might say, uh, uh, just pulling something out, and he so loved the world. And then you got 10 manuscripts saying that. And then you evaluate them for their history and so forth and come to the conclusion. John 3.16 actually says, for God so loved the world. So, we, we have these variant readings, we, we know what they are, we list them, and we evaluate them, uh, making use of various tools that are used to um, discern the authority, the, the provenance, the uh, integrity of any particular reading. Uh, so, it's essential purity that comes down to us over time. Uh, the main message of the gospel comes through loud and clear. All these variants have little to nothing to do with that at all. They're just minor variations of, of the way something is read. Um, 
I can say the same thing in several different ways. The language will be different, the words will be different, but the meaning will be the same. Um, I went outside to play basketball. Um, I went out to the court and played ball, or basketball court and played ball. Um, I went with my friend John to the basketball court and we played basketball. You know, we're saying basically the same thing using different language and the variations don't really affect the original statement. I went to play basketball. Um, they just, you know, we, we can sort through it and the elaborations we might say, well, those are things where people are adding on to the original statement and need to be cleaned out and get back to the original statement, which, which is shorter and more direct. I went out and played basketball. Um, but anyway, all right, so God's exercised singular care over his word and preserved in all ages a state of essential purity, and has enabled it to accomplish the purpose for which he gave it. It is inconceivable that the sovereign God, who is pleased to give his word as a vital and necessary instrument in the salvation of his people, would permit his word to become completely marred in its transmission, and unable <clears throat> to accomplish its ordained end. Rather, as surely as that he is God, we would expect to find him exercising a singular care in the preservation of his written revelation. So because of the significance and the importance of the Word of God, and the fact that God's not continuing to reveal things to us, um, it stands to reason that God would protect that deposit of revelation that he's given to his church, protect that over time so that generations and millennia later people may still come to faith in Jesus Christ and be saved so that only makes sense if you believe in a God who has control of history and time and organizes all things for his own purpose to his own ends so you, your view of God comes into uh, consideration here when we think of um, the nature of the transmission of the scriptures so one thing that we might, I don't know if Skilton will get into this later on, but you might can compare the transmission of the scriptures to the transmission of the plays of Shakespeare or the, the writings of the Greeks like Aristophanes, Sophocles, Euripides, uh, the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle and their documents, Homer's, Iliad, and so forth, and compare the number of manuscripts that we have from those historical documents to what we have in terms of the Old and New Testaments. And you'll find that there is an embarrassment of riches in terms of the Old and New Testaments uh, and the copies that we have of them by comparison to these great works of philosophy and drama and poetry and so forth from the past and history as well. Uh, great works, but very scant evidence for what the original text was. You might have one copy or a couple of copies, or even just a portion of a copy of something uh, uh, living for this time. So you, you have that comparison to make, and that demonstrates, if you will, how God has singularly cared for his word and made sure that the message continues with us even today. That's one matter for us to give thanks to God if you have occasion that in your meditation on the scriptures, thank, be thankful that the word of God has reached you today. Now, almost 2,000 years after the New Testament and you know, 3,000 years since the Old Testament, some, a good bit of the Old Testament. I, I used to teach a course on this. I don't have my notes anymore in Sunday school oh, okay. through the years. I, three or four times I think I caught on it using knowing scripture by R.C. Sproul and can't remember the RPCES guy who wrote a book on this too, but I do remember. I don't have the figures completely accurate. We have three copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars in Latin. We have over five thousand copies of the New Testament. Yeah. So talk about preservation. Yeah. You know. And how many people are 
are saying, oh, look at the errors in the Caesar Gallic, Gallic Wars that by the three translate or three year copies we have. Nobody's nobody's saying anything about them. But they make all sorts of charges against the writings of the New Testament when we have I mean thousands of more copies yeah. of the New Testament than we do of the Latin of Caesar's Scholic Wars. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have the same sort of questioning as to authorship of you know, the, the ancient writers, uh, the Greeks and Romans, um, or questions about the integrity of what we have. Um, there's not much consideration given to that. Um, I think even with Shakespeare, there, there's not much, if anything, of his original drafts or his original plays. Um, we just have the copies of them and so forth. So, um, anyway, we have, we are on very solid ground in terms of what uh, the witnesses are to the original Word of God scriptures. Okay, uh, paragraph on page 143 that God has preserved the scriptures in such a condition of essential purity as we would expect is manifestly the case. The Hebrew text of the Old Testament has survived the millenniums in a substantially and remarkably pure form. Among the extant or continuing to exist manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible from the Christian era, there is an extraordinary agreement. Kennecott, a particular historian, in his edition of the Hebrew Bible with variant readings deals with the consonantal variants in more than 600 manuscripts. Dr. Robert Dick Wilson, who I believe was a Princeton theologian, um, I don't know if we see it here, yeah, he writes in the Princeton Theological Review. Uh, Robert Dick Wilson has pointed out that there are about 284 million letters in the manuscripts considered by Kennecott, and that among these manuscripts there are about 900,000 variants, approximately 750,000 of which are quite trivial variation of Vav and Yod, a couple very minor Hebrew letters. Uh, the, I get these straight. The Vav is kind of like a, uh, a candy cane stick uh, in, in its look and its appearance. And the Yod is just like an apostrophe. And so the very uh, minimal letters in the Hebrew alphabet and could easily be overlooked, um, especially if you're copying from one page to the next. And so, of these 900 variant readings in the Old Testament, uh, 750,000 of them are of that sort of mistaken a yod for a uh, vav and so forth. Um, so, uh, Skilton continues, there is, Dr. Wilson remarks, only about one variant for 316 letters, and apart from the insignificant uh, a Vav and Yod variation, only about one variant for 1,580 letters. The variants, for the most part, are supported by only one or by only a few of the manuscripts. Dr. Wilson has elsewhere said that there are hardly any variant readings in these manuscripts with the support of more than one out of the 200 to 400 manuscripts in which each book is found, except in the full and defective writing of the vowels, a matter which has no bearing on either the pronunciation or the meaning of the text. A couple things here. So, on the one hand, you might have a, a variant reading with regard to a yod or a vav. And what Robert Dick Wilson points out is that that variant reading might occur in one particular copy of the Hebrew, 
but there are 200 to 400 other copies of that same text which have the, the same identical combination or absence of these letters. So you know that that one text is uh, mistaken because you have 200 to 400 other readings that witness to the correct uh, transmission there. And so that helps you to identify, well, this more than likely is an error or a mistake on the part of the copyist. And as well, when you look at it, it might be that it becomes a nonsense word because of the addition or the subtraction of those letters. And so it's very obvious that a mistake was made there. And so you ignore that mistake and you correct it by the other uh, documents. So the multitude of documents that we have mutually inform each other and mutually criticize each other such that uh, we come to have a focus on what is really the original text. And you might say in modern parlance that you come up with or derive a critical text which uh, evaluates the many different copies that we have and reviews the various copies, uh, mistakes or what have you, and comes up with a text uh, on the basis of the research in these texts which seems to suggest uh, what most likely is the original text. And so it seems to me that we have a, a more exact understanding of the original text of Scripture than possibly at any time in history, um, really from the beginning, just virtually from the beginning. Um, we, we stand in a remarkable moment in history in terms of the multitude of witnesses that we have. Um, the, the, at the time of the King James, when it was written, there were only like five Greek New Testament texts that were being used uh, to, to form the text on which they call the Textus Receptus, in, in which they, they copied. Erasmus pu pulls this together and, uh, and that's what he's got. They had very little in terms of Greek manuscripts to work from. Today we have far, far more. And does that not suggest that we have far more evidence to work with and therefore we can come up with a better decision as to what the original text of Scripture was? So, um, the abundance of these... I don't know that they had anything beyond the 13th century. Right. If I'm right, about 300 years older. Right. But now we have back to the... 400s of 300s and 400s yeah. of manuscripts. So we can go back a thousand years earlier right. in our manuscripts than the King James people could. Right, exactly. Does that say something about King James only? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, with those ancient manuscripts, you're getting closer to the original text and you have less opportunity for copyist errors or insertions to occur over the course of time. So over the course of time, these texts, if you will, get bigger because a, a copyist thinks, well, we're missing something here or I've got to explain something there or something needs to be added to it or something. And so the text becomes marginally a little bit larger than the original text. And so um, because of these additions and these adumbrations of the original text, you try to emphasize, clarify, that sort of thing, well-meaning, but uh, you know, it, 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 it's not being exactly faithful to the original text. And so when you come to the King James Version, you have the name of Jesus you know, rolled out the Lord Jesus Christ time and time again. But in the ancient manuscripts, you don't have that full fullness of expression so much. It might be Jesus or the Lord or the Lord Christ or Jesus Christ or something like that. But over time, Men wanted to express their devotion to the Lord Jesus and they would roll out a fuller title and that gets into the King James. And then when more recent manuscripts come back to the King James and say, well, um, the original manuscripts don't have this full name. It just has Jesus or the Lord or Christ or he, a pronoun like Philippians 4 verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Whereas the King James says something like, I can do all things through the Lord, the Lord Jesus or something who strengthens me. Through Christ. Just through through Christ, Christ who strengthens me. 
and when you point out that you know, the ancient texts just say he, and the King James says Christ, well, they get all upset and they say, well, you're trying to remove the name of Christ, the dear name of Christ, from the text of Scripture. You, you want people to forget the name of Jesus Christ. And so like, eh. he is the antecedent to a pronoun to the antecedent noun, which is Jesus Christ. It's just a matter of reading the text to understand what they're talking about. It's, there's nothing lost there. But you can't make headway with some of these folks. And yeah, they're, they're saying you must use the full name of Jesus every time it's written to be written in the New Testament. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, tell that to the Apostle Paul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when he's using the pronouns, the yeah. personal pronouns. Yeah, just go through the King James text and see what pronouns there are that refer to Jesus and say, why, why Why? did the King James not say the Lord Jesus Christ there? I mean, every time, Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, instead of he said, he did. It's ridiculous. But that's their argument, though. Yeah. That's the yeah. foolishness of their argument. And, and they try to castigate modern translations and say that well, you're trying to remove the name of Christ and make the people forget Christ and so these are works of the devil and attempts to pollute the church and these kinds of things. And just I sigh with the Lord Jesus. <laughs> just like that we talked about Sunday. Ah, man. <laughs> okay. Um, page 144, the new paragraph there. The, what time is it? 10.06. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. All right, let me get to the next page and I may jump off there. The agreement which exists among the extant manuscripts of the Hebrew Old Testament, which date from the Christian era, did I read that already? No. Uh, which date from the Christian era is a sign of the extraordinary care exercised in the transmission of the text by the Jews. It is true that the oldest of these witnesses are relatively late. Among the earliest are the Leningrad manuscript of the prophets, which has been dated A.D. 916. That's Anno Domini, after the year of our Lord, 916. And a manuscript of the Pentateuch in the British Museum, which has been brought or thought to date back to the 9th century or earlier. Uh, it was the practice of the Jews to place worn manuscripts in a receptacle called the Geniza, and to use newer copies, which had been made with incredible care. In natural course, the discarded manuscripts perished. But though our extant manuscripts of the Hebrew Old Testament from the Christian era are rather late, the text which they contain can be traced to a considerably earlier time. Now, we'll stop off here and we can consider that further, but I'll just highlight um, a couple things here. This, again, is the Hebrew text, and I don't know if I can get enough light on it, but bring it up close enough. I'll tell you what, time for the old whiteboard. I've been threatening to do this, and I'm going to do it now. <laughs> so, you can see that. This is the word for covenant in Hebrew, berith. This letter here is like our letter B, it's the beth. And then you have this letter that's shaped like an R, is the, the, the letter Rho, if I remember my Hebrew correctly. Um, this is a yod, this little apostrophe here. No, it's resh. Resh? Okay. Sorry, it's been a long time. You're getting Greek and Hebrew mixed up. I am. <laughs> And uh, I'll do that again yet. <laughs> and this is the final letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, kind of like a T sounding letter. Tau. Tau. Uh, I'll let Rex <laughs> tell me what the letters are. <laughs> so uh, below it you see this little colon here, two dots here, a dot here. Um, when you go into the Hebrew, you'll find that you have these consonants, Beth, Roush, Rosh, Roach, Rach, <laughs> Rach. Beth, Rach, Tal. Rach, Rachel, and the Tal. 
I'm waiting for correction. <laughs> so you have uh, these three. By the, by the way, they read correctly as we look at you. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, from right to left. All right. Very good. <laughs> Um, and then the yod here, the yod is a consonant as well. So you've got four consonants here gathered together. And the Hebrew language actually has no vowels to it at all. And what scribes did later on was they added vowel points, which uh, helped you to know how to pronounce this particular word. So if you just had the consonants, like for the English word stop, S-T-P, you would say, well, how do I pronounce this word? except there's a vowel, the letter O. It could be one O, or it could be two O's, stoop, and you still have the same consonants. Or it could be uh, the letter E, step. You have the same consonants, but the vowels change inside. And so, uh, the, in order to clarify what was intended originally, uh, the, the Masoretes would construct a vowel system in which they uh, help readers to understand what the original word is. Um, we'll talk more about that. But the other thing is that the, the copyists would make their copy and then they would count the number of letters in each line and verify that they had the, the right number of letters along the line before they would proceed further. So they had a number of ways of checking to make sure that they copied it correctly from one line to the next. And if you didn't have the same number of letters as you had in the original, then you know, well, you made a mistake somewhere and you got to go back and find out where it is. And that accounted for the, the tremendous accuracy of the Hebrew text that's come down to us today. Think about doing the Psalms. And they knew the middle letter of the middle word of the 150 Psalms. The Masoretes knew those. They, yeah. They counted, and if, if the, I don't know how long it would take them to, to count from Psalm 1 to Psalm 70-something or 8, whatever it was, the middle psalm. But they counted that, and if it was off, they, you know, and their copy was off, what, where had they aired? Yeah, <laughs> they'd go yeah. back go 70 back or that. 80 chapters of, of yeah. the psalms to find them. So you, you can see the minute care that was given to the, the transmission of the text and how they wanted to be sure that they copied the Word of God accurately and faithfully. Um, so hey, I don't know about you guys, but I definitely need more whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that whiteboard. <laughs> I guess I've got one around here somewhere, Lois. Lois uses it a lot for ESL. <laughs> uh, we'll try. We'll probably have more occasion to use it here as we go along. I think it's mine, though. I, I think I used it in, in Sunday school at Bartlesville or <laughs> my church is the best. Well, Lois has con Lois has uh, conscripted it for her ESL. <laughs> Mike gave me this one to let my father know if I was going to leave the house. I would leave write where I was at, when I'd be back, leave a note for my parents or something like that. And so that's where this originally came from. And so oh, I was that was a good idea. Duty here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks again, Mike. Mine's about two, t two or three times that size. Oh yeah? Okay. <laughs> so nice. if I held it up here, I'd disappear. <laughs> nice thing about mine is that it can go horizontal or vertical. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do we have, do we have an easel at church? We used to have one. Um, I might I, have it downstairs I here. Have, I don't have an easel anymore. Yeah. I I never had to use one at Springhouse. I can't remember how many easels I had. I must have had half a dozen easels that I could use at Springhouse. I think there's a big one in the nursery that's holding a chalkboard in there. Okay. Because um, that's I mean, that's I know, nice to be one upstairs. Yeah, and I, I think I had another one that I put down in my basement down here to create some room in the utility room there at the church. I don't know if I still have it, it's still functional, but it would be like for a flannel graph that a Sunday school teacher would have, and they have 
pictures of things that they would put on this flannel graph and story time for kids and that sort of thing. But I don't think it would stand up on its own, you know, so high, whatever. I guess the uh, whiteboards have been replaced by PowerPoint these days. Uh, yeah, computers yeah. and PowerPoints, yep. Yeah, maybe we'll make use of that computer screen downstairs in the Sunday school room and set that up for like a PowerPoint presentation if we get that sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. The whiteboards are fine. I actually, I was asked, I actually was, uh, actually paid for me to take a course at Bucks, at uh, Bucks Junior College or Bucks uh, Community College on PowerPoint. They oh. actually paid for, I think it was like, six or eight week course so and i did a couple of powerpoints just to for the class you know, but i don't think i have them on my computer anymore so <laughs> i'd have to mike figure worked, out what i did with them yeah mike worked with powerpoint presentations too always a lot of fun right yeah, mike? <laughs> yeah it's just uh just a couple i i didn't take a a course, I had a crash course, <laughs> and uh, and then I sought help as I went along making these uh, present gardening presentations, and um, but they're very they're very helpful, and it's amazing what you could do. I, I just scraped the surface of yeah, me too of, of what the possibilities are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, adding in pictures and graphics and fonts and it was just it's just a, it's almost almost limitless you can add video too yeah, uh, yeah 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 music yeah. music yeah. Yeah. yeah the good thing about those when i had to use used to have to use them to uh like i don't know to explain a system or something to somebody when we when i was working uh you can always after you're done with it he can send it to everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, if you have any questions, refer to the PowerPoint. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Very good. But they never would. They'd always call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you come over and do it for me? Oh. Now you're paying me, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a great study. You know, you know, I was thinking of something. How all the great pains. <laughs> These great men and very learned men went to keep this so pure for us. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, <laughs> you, 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 like the way it's being taught to us so, so well by very, very learned pastors and teachers and how fortunate we are when there's, when there's other denominations that just change things in the Bible out on a whim just to just because they think it's they should do it. It's amazing mm -hmm. how how easily. They're willing to just nonchalantly change the word, the, the inspired word of God, to, to, to fit their little culture or whatever it is their their fad is they're dealing with to, to make it okay for them. When yeah. all this painstaking work went into maintaining this the best we can through all the centuries, uh, did you guys ever hear the Oxford Groupers? The Oxford Groups. There's the Oxford uh, back group. in the time of. Uh, New Cardinal Newman, the Oxford group. I, I know that I they were kind of Catholic. I thought there was a Roman Catholic um, club or whatever. I don't know if clubs the right no. word. No, I just heard that they were a group that were that would practice first century Christianity, and they and uh, they they had a they were very strict about. It. I thought maybe if they were part of the Reformation or not. I have to look more into it, but. I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about them myself, but yeah, there was that one Roman Catholic group. Uh, I remember Mel Gibson was part of it, uh, of a very strict uh, keeping the Latin Mass and other traditions. They were very strict about that. I don't know if it's the same group or not. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, then. yeah. No, yeah, yeah they didn't. I thought it might have them here so. in my dictionary of. Theological dictionary, but I don't see them listed. 
Um, so I, I don't know. They could be. They could be Catholic. Or something, but but I like the, um, the the way I understand it. It was a Catholic group, a more uh, conser a conservative, more Bible believing Catholic group. I think. So I think in that sense that we might agree with them as far as uh, some things. But so how <coughs> Roman Catholic they were, I can't recall. But. Um, I was thinking it was in the 1800s, but I'm not sure about that. What was the name of the group that John Wesley and George Whitfield were a part of when they were at was it Oxford? Wasn't it the Oxford group or something like that? Maybe. I don't remember no, um, for sure. But didn't they go still by Methodist? Well, eventually they did, of course. But oh, maybe they were Methodist then. I thought yeah. they had a... Anyway, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, we can Google it. So. I've often wondered, like, back back when the church was dealing with that King James only issue, I I, I often, from that time on, I've I've just wondered, what is the motivation? Why does a person need to adopt this? What what are they looking for? And um, I always thought that that was a way of getting at the heart of the issue. Exactly, exactly. What are you trying to do? What What's missing that you need to do this? I and think, if that could be addressed, maybe yeah. they could be helped. I think uh, one motivating factor was that they saw the very concerned about our culture and what's happening in the culture, and they saw the decay and collapse of our culture, particularly in recent years, the '60s on onward. And they wanted to give an explanation for why is it that the culture has collapsed so dramatically. And the answer is, well, that's the time when a lot of the modern new translations became popular and the King James Version began to be put aside. And so um, they, um, they, they can explain the collapse of culture on the move of Christians from the King James Bible to the New American Standard and then the New International Version, the English Standard Version, and you know the Phillips translation and all these different things. And, and, and that helps them to put into some context um, what has occurred. Um, so it, it, it doesn't seem to uh, uh, appeal to them that, or, or, or arise to them that there were many heresies that and, and corruptions to our culture long before what happened in the 60s, uh, going back into the deist movement back in the early part of our American experience, and there were no rivals to the King James Version at that time, and so the the advance of unbelief throughout our culture can't be charged just to the, the rise of new translations, it was occurring even with the King James Version of the Bible. And so, the, you know, a return to the King James Bible is no guarantee that our culture will be restored. Mm -hmm. and, well, Arianism, Arianism goes back to what, 300 AD or yeah. whatever with Athanasius and Arius. And, I mean, we only had the Greek manuscripts. And, right. And, well, so... Yeah. 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 Error, error started in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. yeah it continues with us throughout <laughs> history and time. And, yeah. So. Has God said, somebody said. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, one of the proponents would point to, was it Psalm 12, where uh, it talks about the scriptures being preserved seven times, like silver is preserved, something to that effect. Let me see if I can pull that up. Um, it's been a while since I've looked at that. Yeah, Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground purified seven times. And so 
they take that to mean that the translation of the King James Bible is the pure word of God. Now, how is it that that particular translation was set apart from all other translations leading up to it or thereafter? You know, why is that particular translation the purified word of God and others are not? No real argument for that. Um, so... I think that, that that can cause a lot of trouble for a growing Christian because yeah. I think that, the, the you know, first of all, per, persons should be in a good reform church with a great pastor. And just whatever the whatever Bible that the pastor's using, you should, you should use. So, you, it's, you, so you're following word for word. And if you have any questions, you can ask or it's more clear. I used to hate when someone would get up there and start reading King James. And I'm like. I, I'm just, I'm so busy trying to like, you know, immediately my mind wants to like de de decipher what the King James says according to the ESV or something. And I got absolutely nothing out of it. Yeah. yeah. And I spend my whole time like, and I'm like, eh, put the Bible down. That's no good. That, 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 that's a, that doesn't help the person uh, who's, who's trying to grow as a Christian to be all, to, just to, to put two different versions at her, especially with the, I, I don't, I just don't, personally, I don't like King James, the King James English, but I, I don't understand it. I don't. I, I want it in the in the language I know. The words I can take home and look up and everything. If, if I or the questions I can ask that are that make sense. If I need to learn something, or it, I think it, it really uh, it, it can do some harm to, to people that are up and coming and oh, growing. It, it really is a temptation to pride. I can't. I can't believe I just finished reading a book a month, couple months ago about the King James only and the, the, the language they use against other Christians, the uh, egos of, of these people and all. There's a guy at Pensacola Christian uh, College who is sort of one of the ringleaders other than uh, I mean, he's made charges against uh, men that we would all say, you know, like a, like a, a Van Til or like a Murray, you know, made charges against men like them that are absurd. Yeah. It's just because they don't believe in the King James own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we heard that. We heard that back back at the church uh, when it was. When we were hearing that, right, weren't there charges against B.B. Warfield and stuff, Rich, and that these men were deluded or yeah, something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That they they were compromised in some way yep. because because they didn't use the King King James. Mm -hmm. Ridiculous stuff. There was a statement made by a, a body of evangelicals, including J.I. Packer, uh, James Montgomery Boyce, R.C. Sproul and others like them on uh, the nature of the scriptures and they talked about how the, we receive the original manuscripts as inspired and errant word of God but the copies are uh, fallible copies but the text is still reliable and I would refer that to uh, our brother who was attending the church he just dismissed them all as misguided and, and you know led by the devil and it just what do you do at that point you know when you've got godly men like R.C. Sproul and James Montgomery Boyce and J.I. Packer of all people um, who uh, oppose this viewpoint of King James only um, and then you go calling them deluded and those who are the tools of Satan and that sort of thing. Um, it's just a, it's very sad. Um, it reminds me to give out a warning about what you come across on the internet. Make sure you talk to your pastor about what you're reading, you know. And people get all excited about certain things. They see videos and <coughs> I think that you know, they've got 
the truth and everybody else is not in the know, you know, so they got the secret access to the real truth and everybody else is uh, lost. Um, sometimes they need to be pulled back into a reality. But, um, I had a man leave my church in New Mexico, in Roswell, New Mexico, because uh, we weren't dispensational. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and all. And he got into some uh, Jewish evangelist or uh, man. I think the man's name was Good, G, G O O D E. And he was a converted Jew. And evidently he was teaching, you know, the churches that don't believe in the dispensational. Way and see the Jews, see the Jews as you know, in the right way, and everything were heretical. And my uh, ruling elder and I had a, a, a bad time at their house trying to convince this. Mm -hmm. And they weren't young either, they were um, oh, yeah. older than my elder and I, yeah. and they got but they got hooked up in this false teaching. A kind of enthusiasm comes over people, and they will not listen to anybody else. No one can correct them. They're they they're excited about what they found. They think it's the explanation that they were looking for, and off they go. Yeah. Um, this brother in our church, he he loved the King James Bible for himself and his own personal reading, and this was kind of like confirmation bias when he comes across all these teachings about the King James only as the Word of God inspired. And he, you know, had a great political interest in things that were happening in the world, and he saw the corruption of the world, and suddenly things began to make sense to him that the, the evils of the world are because of an abandonment of the King James uh, Bible. Then, you know, he was not willing to let everything else now has become the, the, the message of Satan, the uh, deception, and these people are corrupt, and uh, off he went. So. Yeah, don't drink the Kool-Aid. That's right. It's, <laughs> it was sad. It's just, I mean, that's it's bad. Sad. But um. Anyway. This is a book that Rich talked about. Yeah. Uh, some months ago, and I went online and bought a copy. Oh, there you go. It really is an excellent book. He does a great job in defending uh, the, the true position right. yeah. <laughs> on, on manuscripts and so forth and why the King James is not the only inspired Bible. Um, yeah. It was, it's, uh, for those who are We'll look at this video later. It's the King James Only Controversy by James R. White. Uh, yeah. Excellent book. I, I read it myself. He does a very good job with that. D.A. Carson also has a good book on it. Yes, he does. Yeah. I have that book too. Yeah. Um, so both of them are. D.A. Carson's book is not as um, thorough as this the one by White, but it's a great book. And, and my uh, professor, uh, president of my seminary, Dr. McCray, also wrote a little book on the King James Only. Uh, I think I have that somewhere. I'd have to look it up. But um, it's it's more like a pamphlet. But but from the time I was in seminary, uh, when he uh, Dr. McCray wrote that book, but uh, you know we were we were taught that in seminary, you know, don't. Don't fall for these King James only people. I think my James White copy is right about there. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> oh, I see it. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a little tip, um, a computer tip for uh, those watching these intense studies with really good teachers. When they start showing all their books and whiteboards, <laughs> yeah. if, 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 you, if you put your mouse over their picture, this little this little a piece comes up where it's like looks like a, a tack and a speaker and three dots on the right. If you click on the tack, it brings it brings their picture up and most of the screen, so you can oh. you, you can see like the whiteboard 
better or that you can see the book there the book of the minute that they're showing yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and it's especially when they're flipping the pages and everything. <laughs> but it really helps well, what's that the three the three dots you go to the three dots uh, on the bottom yeah, yeah, of your screen click on the one that looks like a pin it looks like a, it looks like a tag the, the one on the left yeah then it if, you, if you click on that it expands the, everything yeah, oh, yeah. Know, a lot of times. Yeah, got it. Because well, yeah. you can always then you can always take a screenshot uh, of the of the book or of the of the whiteboard for for later review to try to <laughs> make sure you're absorbing all this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I I mean, some helpful tools as we're in these advanced, super advanced, awesome classes here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did that on your picture, well, Chuck, and I see you need a shave. <laughs> Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, By the way, uh, it expands it quite a bit. <laughs> you find, too. I know it's you yeah. find books on the uh, you find books on the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was a one of the greatest finds of the last century. Was the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it it has done so much to help in the what it, what we call textual criticism where uh, not that you're criticizing the Bible, but defending the, the text of Scripture and, and so on uh, and all. Uh, there's some great books out there. Uh, Evans, there's a guy named Evans, I think his last name is, who um, has written a good book on how they, what the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls was. Uh, also a man named Pfeiffer, from, who's dead now, Charles Pfeiffer. He was a Professor, I think, at Central Michigan uh, University, a very faithful scholar, though, and he's written books about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the importance of them, and uh, he was a great Old Testament scholar. So I have a number of his books. But, uh, you know, it really has helped. I mean, we have, it would be pretty hard to defend the King James only if we didn't have the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, finds and some of the things that we've learned from them, because we got hundreds of documents and and, and things, especially a, a very old copy, the oldest copy of the book of Isaiah, scroll of Isaiah, came out of the Dead Sea Scrolls.